So in terms of general advice, what is one of the main things that you tell all patients when it comes to reducing the recurrence of stone and the risk of stone if there are a risk? I'm going to start with saying basically water. <laughs> I thought you were going to do it at the same time. Yeah, no. <laughs> water. <laughs> Lemons is a very natural way of alkalizing your urine. Uh -huh. And I quite commonly say to patients to squeeze, and there is evidence for this, to squeeze mm. the juice of one or two whole lemons per day into a litre of water. So you get a big litre jug, yeah. squeeze one or two whole mm. lemons in, uh -huh. and then drink that as your throughout the day as your as your fluid. Interesting. And you're getting the benefits of all that citrate from the from the yeah. lemons naturally which will alkalize your urine and, and it's a way of flavoring it as well so yeah that's a really good thing to do so i mean the other thing people take about i don't know about benefit but risk um is protein supplements uh -huh. well yeah so protein build up drinks i go to the gym i need to do this mm -hmm. um, and i universally say that that increases your risk of kidney stones mm -hmm. doctor's kitchen recipes health lifestyle Thanks so much for coming in today. Uh, really excited to have you both here. Nish, we've known each other for a few years uh, and you were telling me about this amazing uh, conference that you went to or the, a presentation that you heard. Uh, so how do you know each other professionally? Uh, well, yeah, so on that um, conference presentation, that was uh, Matt Bultitude uh, was doing, uh, your, that was your presentation that you did at the RSM when you were asked to um, debunk, I think, stone supplements. Oh yeah, Which maybe we come on to before, but that's <laughs> where I kind of first thought of this, and we met for a coffee. And yeah, discussed it from there really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, just because I thought that was interesting, and it was it was not like the typical kind of um, stone talk, I guess. It was yeah, more on supplements and diet and things. Um, yeah, so that was it. But uh, I was just saying earlier that we met um, some some ten years ago now because. Uh, I was um, running uh, some conferences. It was called the Digital Doctor at that time. It's mm. like health IT. It was something slightly different. And then you were doing your editor of the website for BJUI. And so they suggested, uh, when we approached them, they suggested you could come and talk to us. Because it was at that point, you'd just gone digital from a paper journal. Um, yeah, that's right. Yeah. We've done. A f I think we've done a few blogs together, haven't we? And done for, some blogs for different conferences, that, yeah. and then we all obviously went to that conference and wrote that up for the mm. BJUI. And yeah. Then, then yeah, as you say, we um, recently I was invited to to do this talk in America about mm. supplements yeah. and kidney stones, and that's yeah. the talk I then gave at the the Royal Society. So yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's all pretty uh, serendipitous because one of my best friends has got a stone, a recurrent stone, and so he was asking me about diet, and then we just went for coffee and we just started talking talking about stone. So I thought, well, let's just do a podcast about it because I'm sure there are a lot of people who've uh, who have got issues with kidney stones uh, who would love to know a bit about diets and whether supplements are actually worth it. Because there's a lot of supplements on, on the market, aren't there? Uh, there are, uh, increasingly so. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, yeah. And I, I suspect it's very, very confusing for patients to know uh, what is what is good and bad because everything is marketed totally. as, as you know being good in some way for kidney stones with very little evidence to back them up. Yeah, yeah. And Matt, uh, so you have a particular interest in this and you run one of the largest uh, clinics in the world looking at a specific type of of kidney stone, is that? Yeah, that's right. So I, I'm specialist interested in kidney stones as a surgeon, um, but also in, in, in terms of prevention. Mm. And so uh, where I work at Guys, we run a, a metabolic stone clinic specifically for this condition called cystinuria, mm. which is a very rare condition. So most people listening to this podcast will not have, if anyone will have cystinuria, um, it's less than one in 2,000 oh, people okay, have yeah. it. Mm. So, uh, but uh, we have yeah, the largest clinic in the world, I believe, mm. um, looking at that condition, which is uh, genetic. So people are... Um, uh, predisposed to stone formation throughout their lives and often present in childhood with quite big stones. Mm. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I think it's, uh, yeah, it's even rare for urologists. Like, it's one of the things that we learn for the exam, but, you know, I've, I've not actually seen a patient with cysteine, so it's interesting that you have that clinic. And, and it's kind of famous, really, for it. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, I've got a general sort of overview of how I think this conversation should mm. go, but I'm sure we're going to meander and go, of course, so feel free to. But uh, let's talk a bit about kidney stones, what they are. Actually, no, let's go back a little bit further. Let, let's talk about kidneys. Like, wh why do we have kidneys? What's their, what's their function? And uh, a little bit about the anatomy. Um, so, I mean, in simple terms, I guess the kidneys filter your blood as the main things. They're also involved in um, a few hormone pathways in terms of um, maintaining regulation of um, different chemicals in your blood. Uh, Anatomy-wise, they're kind of under your ribs, but mm -hmm. quite deep structures um, as well. Um, they're connected to your bladder by your ureters, which are sort of thin tubes going down to your bladder, which is where urine collects, and then you, you pee it out from there. And then it's a very basic overview. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, so they, so they filter, the, filter the blood, don't they? Get yeah. rid of all the waste. Yeah. 
uh, which comes out um, in the urine. But they also regulate, as you say, different hormones and regulate blood pressure as well. So they're, yeah. they're vital for blood pressure regulation. Absolutely, yeah. And so w when, we, when we're talking about kidney stones, what do we mean by kidney stones? Um, so I suppose well, a stone is a, um, a, I suppose a clump of crystals mm -hmm. that form um, in the urine, so with it, almost within the center of the kidney, so mm -hmm. in, in the free part, um, which can often just sit up in the kidney um, for weeks, months, years, mm -hmm. um, until at some point it decides to move and then drops down, blocks the, the ureter, the pipe, yep. running down towards the bladder, yep. which then causes what the pain that everyone associates with kidney mm -hmm. stones, which is supposedly the worst pain imaginable yeah. um, when you have a blocked kidney. Yeah. yeah. And I guess because urine looks colorless, you forget that it basically contains lots of these salts normally, like for most people, but it also contains things that sort of buffer uh, stone formation as yeah. well. So there's a kind of balance between the two. And most people, that means that you don't then form stones. Mm -hmm. um, but obviously for people who do, there's an imbalance there, mm -hmm. um, which you know could be for lots of reasons, including like genetic, which uh, like the cysteine urea stones that we were talking about earlier. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll get into um, some of the reasons as to why someone yeah. one is predisposed to having stones, but let's give a sort of um, an overview of like how prevalent kidney stones are. I'm sure if it's around one in 10 people in the UK, a lot of people listening to this are going to have experienced mm. a stone or know someone who's experienced a stone. What, what are the general sort of overview in terms of how prevalent this condition is? Yeah, so increasingly pre uh, prevalent over the last few decades, mm. uh, probably linked with in, uh, increasing obesity and Western diets. Yeah. Um, I often quote that figure of about w lifetime risk of about one in 10. Mm -hmm. That's actually a figure for men. Um, women, it, it, it traditionally has been rarer. Okay. But that gap is actually narrowing and that's that's sort of fast approaching. It's probably one in eight or something like that yeah, now. Yeah. Um, because, um, uh, yeah, I think because of the same sort of Western diets and, and obesity. Mm, yeah, it's interesting that because I... I remember going to medical school. I wasn't really uh, privy to it being a diet-related issue or an obesity-related mm. issue. I think it was more the genetic components. I think in a similar vein to you learning about mm. the specific rare crystals for the exams. That's sort of what I was thinking about when it comes to stones, but I've, I don't think I've, I, I remember being taught about diet. Mm. Uh, I, d I don't think we particularly cover diet either at medical school uh, for stones or particularly for much yeah, I, I guess other disease as well. I mean, there's so much you've got to learn at that point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, I suppose that's why we're talking about it a bit today, because the more you go into it, the more you you, you know, focus on that one area, then you learn about all of the surrounding things that impact it. Yeah. And diet is one of those things that we do know a bit about for kidney stones. You know? Yeah. We're probably showing our age a bit now, aren't we? I mean, we yeah. It's been <laughs> yeah. a while since we were at medical school. Yeah, right? I know. <laughs> and also the textbooks we use were older and they tend to focus on the pathological conditions yes. um, that yeah. cause kidney stones and anatomical yeah. conditions that might yeah. cause kidney stones and yeah. won't focus on that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so let's talk a bit about stones themselves. So you, you, you describe them as a clump of crystals. How do we differentiate stones from, from each other? What are the commonest types? So by far and away, the most common type is something called calcium oxalate. Mm -hmm. That makes up about 80% of, of all stone uh, types. So I think most people who've had one or two stones in their lifetime, it's a good guess that they will have had a calcium oxalate stone or predominantly mm -hmm. calcium oxalate stone. Mm -hmm. uh, there are then rarer types, so calcium phosphate is a distinct type. But often you get a mixture of stones. So quite a common thing we would see was that a stone is 80% made, made of calcium oxalate, 20% mm -hmm. made of calcium phosphate. Okay. And that may be the way that it's formed in the kidney, that actually you get a bit of calcium phosphate and then you get the oxalate layering on top of that uh, okay. uh, to form, to form mm -hmm. the stone. So those are the two most common. Um, and then there's uric acid stones, which... Uh, are very different uh, because they're radiolucent, which means they don't show up on X-ray. Right. So you can't. So you can do an X-ray and they won't. Well, you won't see yeah. them. So that's not a good way of, of checking for those. Yeah. And they can also be dissolved, and we'll obviously, I think, come on to that later. Mm -hmm. mm. Um, so important to differentiate between those. Um, and I think traditionally, down the list. a number of <laughs> percentage-wise, is probably five to ten percent. Okay. Mm. Um, of kidney stones and metaluric acid. Okay. But then when you consider obese and diabetic populations, it can be as high as twenty to thirty percent. Ah. Mm. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So one in three, if you're obese or you have diabetes, will actually have uric acid stones. Potentially. Yeah. Ah. Mm. Interesting. Okay. And what are the other types of stones that we're getting to the more rarer sort of? Mm. Yeah, we're now getting down the list, aren't we? So, yeah. 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 I mean, cysteine, which is the thing we mentioned earlier, is quoted in textbooks as being one percent i don't think that's true in terms of what we actually see one percent yeah. of people coming in with cysteine stones but that's what textbooks say yeah so that's rarer and then you, there's a, a range of 
other rare types of stones. And you can get drug stones as well, and they are very, very mm. different, but probably just worth a mention to say that yeah. certain drugs and certain HIV drugs in particular, which have been notorious mm. for it, because mm. drugs are often ex are usually excreted in the kidney, so there's yeah. high levels of, of, of that drug in the urine, and if certain, for whatever reasons, that crystallizes out as well, then that can form a drug stone of whatever that, that drug type was. Mm -hmm. Those are pretty rare, but also can be quite hard to find, because again, they, they don't, often don't show up on they don't show up on x-ray or CT scan, mm. which is the thing that most people will get if they walk into the emergency department, you get yeah. a CT scan, yeah, yeah. Uh, because it's not actually made of anything crystalline yes. that shows up. Yeah. Yeah, so they can yeah. be diff more difficult to diagnose. That That's yeah. really interesting from an a &E perspective, actually, because if you're doing a CT scan, CTKUB, it's not gonna come up on the C, but you've still mm. got a high degree of suspicion that, and you, you yeah, ruled out other things, w w then, then what? Well, like on the uric acid stones, you were saying that they're not, you, you would usually see them on CT, but not x-ray. When yeah. that, So now with CT, we tend to be able to see okay. uh, uric acid stones, which is, but the drug stones that you mentioned, yeah. you sometimes just can't even see them on CT. So okay. uh, that is difficult. And then I guess it depends on exactly how the patient is, if they still got pain or anything mm -hmm. else with the I think other symptoms with that. But I'm... Um, you may end up still going up inside and, and doing a ureteroscopy, yeah. which is where you're basically putting a telescope up towards the kidney to yeah. see what the cause of that problem is. And actually, it's my, I recently had like my first drug stone that I've seen really. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. Recently, <laughs> oh, which was go. where we, we weren't expecting to find that, but there was a stone uh, that was causing an issue for that patient, basically. Um, and we, we weren't expecting to find that, but when we looked inside, there, there was a stone, we ended up lasering it. Yeah. yeah, and so I think it is about having an index of suspicion and mm. the doctors in the emergency department may not have that, mm. but you may see a secondary signs as well. So there's one thing on the CT scan of, of actually seeing the stone itself, but then because it causes blockage, you, you may well then just see a blocked kidney. You won't mm. know why, but mm. there's a blocked kidney with yeah. maybe mm. some fluid that's leaked around it. Yeah. So you'll see the secondary signs of that, yeah. which will then make you think, well, why has that happened? Yeah. And, if, and you can also give some an injection of dye with the CT scan in those situations, which we don't normally do, but in that mm. situation you might do. Right. And then you'd see that excreted through the kidney and you'd see a sort of missing bit where, the st where that drug stone is. So then, so that can help as well with diagnosis. Yeah, yeah. And, and moving down that list. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> we've got, we got rare yeah. stones here. Well, with the, the, the stones associated with chronic infections, which is a, an increasing issue, I think, mm. as we're seeing more antimicrobial resistance. Do you mean like struvite stones? Struvite yeah. stones, um, yeah. So that's, that's, we well, missed those out, didn't we, in that, mm. in that, in did, in that yeah. percentage yeah. order yeah, coming yeah, down. Yeah. So we're going yeah, back yeah, up, so. yeah, yeah. <laughs> They're like uh, magnesium ammonium phosphate stones related to sort of bacteria that's uh, basically, particularly proteus bacteria, mm -hmm. but um, they kind of, essentially split uh, urea uh -huh. and as a result of that you end up getting urea which is in your ur urine mm -hmm. normally and the, as a result of that you can end up getting stones essentially from ex excess crystals if you like okay um yeah and yeah in kind of simple terms and again that's that's an interesting stone to treat because it's caused by the bacteria mm. so the bacteria live in the stone mm. and so people are often getting recurrent infections maybe seeing their GP, get given some antibiotics, get better, get infection again, get, get better. And that mm. cycle goes on until someone does submit some, a scan and usually finds they have this sort of very big classical stone called a staghorn stone when it fills yeah. all the calyces of the kidney. Um, and you really have to try and get rid of all bits of stone in that situation. Um, otherwise, because because the bugs are living there, you can re you remove 70% of it, mm. the 30% have still got bugs in it, mm. and it just it can grow very, very quickly again. Yeah. Um, so, so they can be challenging to treat as well. Yeah, is this a particular issue uh, in women uh, of menopausal age uh, as well? Is that an association that you, you've seen? So, in, well, infections are more common in women, aren't yeah. they? So, yeah. So, so they may be getting recurrent infections, which then lead to uh, more alkaline urine, which leads mm. to precipitation of this stone. The bacteria is there. So, yes. Yes, that's true. Yeah, mm. yeah. We're going to talk about urine alkalinization and right, yeah, acidification yeah. in a bit because uh, it's definitely something that I think there's a lot of misinformation around mm. uh, and uh, that there isn't too Well, that doesn't necessarily work for the struvite stones, actually. I mean, like you say, we may come onto that later. Yeah. But because the because of that mechanism to do with the bacteria, and yeah. so I think if I'm going to get it right or wrong, but it's essentially like urea is breaking down to ammonia yeah. and then uh, you're getting a sort of a hydroxide, which is kind of making it alkali. Mm. So alkalization doesn't help in that case. Exactly. But, yeah, yeah. 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 So, so that's one of the uh, unusual cases where you wouldn't want to mm. have alkaline urine. You'd want to acidify fight instead but we'll talk about it in a second yeah. <laughs> we'll talk about it in a second because yeah. i'm gonna get myself confused all right so when we when we're talking about before we go into specific management mm -hmm. of those particular stones 
general advice that has been given by uh, Baus. I think you guys said it was the mm. British Association of Urology Surgeons. Yeah. Surgeon. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> There's all these acronyms. Yeah. I forgot to pick you up on another one. What was the uh, the journal that you were mentioning earlier? The British. Oh, the British Journal of Urology International. Oh, there you go. Uh, okay, BGR. Yeah, yeah, that's the one. RSM um, was Royal Society of Medicine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's on me. I need to yeah. make sure that we're not using yeah. too much jargon because it's, it's a complicated subject. So, in terms of general advice, what, what is one of the main things that you tell all patients when it comes to reducing the recurrence of stone and the risk of stone if there are a risk? I'm going to start with saying basically water. <laughs> I thought you were going to do it at the same time. Yeah, no. water. <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting for like a perfectly harmonized yeah. water. <laughs> water um, yeah. yeah, I mean, the most common problem is people don't drink enough water. And mm -hmm. so de mm -hmm. dehydration is common. Yeah. So if you, I, I tend to say to patients, if you're going to change one thing, change the amount of fluid you drink. Mm -hmm. um, that is absolutely key to all stone types. There's no exceptions. Yeah. Fluid is key. Yeah. And for those who've got infections as well, it's good. It's, it's in important for reducing infections as well. So you can change one thing, change fluid. Yeah. And typically we sort of say you should be drinking two to three liters a day. Mm -hmm. But that is going to be depend a lot on the individual um, and where they live, their lifestyle. Yeah. If you go to the gym and you lose a liter in sweat, you've got to replace that on top of that. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so really what the studies have shown is that you need to be producing about two liters of urine a day. So that's what comes out. Mm -hmm. And to do that, the typical person has to have about two and a half, three liters in to yeah. achieve that. But as I say, some people, if you run a marathon, you lose a lot more than that. You gotta replace loads more, haven't you? So, so quite a useful guide is actually to either measure your urinary volume if you wanted to in one a given day, just to yeah. see what you're doing. But I also tell patients to just look at the color of the urine as well. Mm. You know, mm. If you've had a few drinks, if you like beer and have a few beers, you go to the toilet, your, your urine looks almost colorless, doesn't yeah. it? It does look completely clear. Now that's gonna be hard to do in day-to-day -day life during the day. But actually the lighter it is, the more dilute it is. Mm. And that's because you're drinking lots mm. and got lots of uh, lots of fluid passing through and just flowing through the kidneys. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, so that's good. Conversely, if you go to the toilet and it looks like treacle, so it's you know really yellowy, then that's a sign of very concentrated urine, mm. and that's how stones form because they crystallize out in concentrated uh, solutions. Yeah. So that's a sign you need to be drinking more. And you're allowed to look like that first thing in the morning. You haven't drunk overnight, <laughs> so you get up and you go, and it's quite concentrated. Yeah. But after that, throughout the day, you want to try and get your urine looking much more dilute. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because the, um, the the bow sleeve that we, we spoke about actually talks about tactics to try and drink that much water because it's not an, a normal thing that you would do. So I've actually tried and repeat that to patients and kind of in the the spiel of saying like, actually what you might try and do is have, have a glass of water or a pint of water first thing in the morning. Mm. Then every time that you have some food, you have a glass of water before and afterwards, every time you go and pee, you have a glass of water when you come back. Um, and it kind of builds it into your day then that you're drinking throughout. Um, yeah. But then it's it, you're speaking to colleagues and like friends as well. Um, they they said people have said similar things like aim for colourless urine. Mm. But if that seems a bit vague to some people, and, um, and then um, one of my uh, colleagues, Hamida Budi, actually at Imperial, said that um, he said he bases it on the sort of motivation of the patient a little bit. Where if they seem very motivated to really know exactly how much, then he would give them a jug and say, um, you can measure your output, and you're aiming for that two to three liters that you said, like you said, measuring. Yeah. yeah. As well. So then, if they are motivated enough, they can keep track of it themselves rather than looking at input of like drinking two yeah. to three liters. Yeah. And you only need to do that once. You only need to know once roughly what your urine output is. You know, yeah. Yeah. Like every week you've got to test it because then you know roughly what, you know, if I go to the toilet six or seven times a day, everyone's got different bladders. So everyone's got a different bladder capacity. So yeah. some people have small bladders and need to go go every, maybe store 200, maybe 250 mils. Yeah. Some people who maybe have been rugby players can store 600, 700 mils. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And they only go four yeah. times a day, but they're probably making the same amount of urine. So actually the number of times you go during the day is not necessarily a reliable sign if you've got a smaller bladder capacity. Mm. I've got a dog uh, <laughs> and uh, we've trained her to sort of like hold her her urine. Is that something that humans can do as well? <laughs> yeah, I'm just, because we, we have to keep on taking her out like out of our flat. We don't we don't have a garden. So, you know, we've been basically training her to keep her urine in for a bit longer while still making sure that she's drinking enough water, particularly in the hot weather. Is that something that you, you can yeah, do? Yeah, definitely. I mean, that we- Sorry, the oddball that question there. <laughs> don't we do it for stone patients, yeah, for yeah. other patients. You do things like bladder training or bladder drills mm. um, for people with the, the small capacity bladders we spoke about. Yeah, so in that yeah. situation, yeah. that's correct. Yeah. You want to try and train your, your brain. Yeah. You don't need to go so often, so actually you're gonna let your bladder expand a bit more. Yeah. Mm. But for other types, other groups of patients, that sort of doing that long-term can be damaging to the bladder because mm. you're over-expanding your bladder. Mm. So we 
see that sometimes in certain mm. professions, taxi drivers, bus drivers, yeah. people who can't go to the toilet regularly yeah. over years and years and years end up getting chronic retention where they get, you know, litre capacity bladders, yeah. which then slowly sort of stop, stop working properly. So, ah, um, I wonder if it's the same in medics as well. Cause I remember <laughs> I got into uh, a habit of drinking like five to 600 mils of water at the start of the day mm. before the ward round, because I knew during the ward round, like three, four mm. hours or whatever, I wouldn't be able to drink any water, just running around and stuff. So I wonder if it's- Yeah, I think sometimes in the hospital environment, it's the combination of not drinking anything yeah. and not going to the toilet as well. Yeah, yeah, happens, yeah. So. exactly. Yeah, yeah. I don't know what that does to you, whatever, but. I think surgeons who do long operations struggle with that as well. Mm. You, know, you drink a bit and then yeah. you do, if you start a 10 hour operation, you don't drink anything at all. That's yeah. really bad for stones. Yeah, mm. yeah, and no, I can imagine. Um, I had another question there actually about, uh, oh yes, um, the timing of uh, when you drink as well. So mm. I, I've, I was looking through a number of different uh, patient leaflets from different hospitals, different trusts, and some of them suggest that you should drink before going to bed as well to, to maintain mm. sort of hydration levels throughout the night uh, as well. And obviously, you know, that's going to mean that you're going to disrupt your sleep. You're going to have to mm. get up in the middle of the night. Is that something that we have to also take into consideration? The fact that you should be hydrating throughout the 24 hour period? Yeah, I think is that circadian kind of drinking is that, uh, yeah, essentially, you know, if you're going to be de dehydrated at any point, then that's going to increase your risk of stones, like you're saying, that first morning pee is going to be quite concentrated but do you do that with your cysteine stones maybe? so yeah or i was going to say so yeah, in, in that rare risk. situation we, yeah. we do sometimes well, we do mm. um but I, it, life's got to be livable hasn't it so yeah. you know you don't want to be doing that so then you get up once or twice at exactly. night to go to the toilet mm. just from a lifestyle point of view and then tiredness so i think for a lot of the listeners who've had one or two stones that isn't something you particularly need to be doing mm. is any different from what you currently do yeah for very rare stone formers or very very common stone formers so cysteine is the classic example yeah. that yes they are often you know in extreme examples we have probably only one or two patients they actually set an alarm for the middle of the night to drink a pint of water ah, to, right. so but that is a real extreme mm. yeah yeah um, and if you think about it what you want to do is just be trying to spread your water out throughout the day mm -hmm. you know my example of the surgeon not drinking during that's that's bad isn't it you dehydrate yeah. all day you can't then just have two liters at six yeah i think that that solves that you want it to be trying continuous throughout the day yeah something like you said about having a glass of water to drinking it regularly mm. i i have a a, a little 600 mil bottle mm. i care I, mean, I can't believe i haven't got it now yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I, I need to bought it with me now i didn't yeah. I, done. Yeah. But I actually keep it on my on my desk um, i show patients and when they go mm. oh i can't drink that much i go well i can yeah Here's my bottle where's your yeah. bottle oh i yeah. don't have one yeah. why not and so many people are desk based in their job and actually yeah. there should be no excuse then why they can't mm. do that to drink more mm. and i think if you if you get in a habit of doing it regularly yeah. you then actually do feel thirsty and you do want to keep doing it mm. but you just got to get into that habit of just going every morning i come into work fill up my bottle drink it by 11 fill it up again fill yeah. it up again after lunch something like that and then suddenly if you have three or four of those a day that's two liters you've had of water mm. on top of everything else you're doing yeah that's just a very simple way of just trying to trying to uh, achieve that yeah mm. definitely yeah, no, i agree Flu balance is super interesting because in pediatrics, obviously, we're, we're, mm. we're uh, prescribing water uh, according to their weight and, you know, we're, we're doing a much more sort of involved approach. Whereas with adults, it's sort of like two and a half liters a day is the general amount. But I guess you, you mm. can sort of titrate it to your needs by measuring it as a one off mm. and then just looking at the color as well. Those are sort of the main metrics. Unless uh, unless you're in a, you know, literally in a HDU environment or a hospital environment. Yeah, I think so. I think, you know, like it's going to it's going to change by the season, by the amount of activity and everything mm. else. So, I, you know, I think those would be good general tactics to keep an eye on how much you're drinking and your output, particularly for you. Uh, yeah, yeah that, I think that both those things make sense, really. Yeah. Yeah. And stones are a lot more common in the summer. Oh, yeah. There's a reason for that, isn't there? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Hotter, and you're more dehydrated. Yeah. So yeah. actually, you need to drink more in the summer to replace the loss you get through sweat. Let's talk about the type of water, because mm. uh, I know that we're, I, we're definitely <laughs> going to be asked about that. You know, are there particular types of water you should be drinking? Is there a difference in the type of water you get in different parts of the country or different parts of the world? Should we be worried about that? I know you, you've looked into that. You've probably been asked that a mm. bunch of times, haven't you? Uh, yeah, and patients always ask this question. Yeah, yeah. they do, yeah. Um, you know, where I live, the water's really hard. You should see what it does to my kettle. Yeah, yeah, that yeah. That sort yeah. of thing. Um, so no wonder I keep forming stones. And, you mm. know, this idea that you're furring up inside by drinking water, which isn't actually true from hard water. So hard water is hard because of calcium carbonate, um, which isn't what stones, I just said cal stones are made mm. of calcium <laughs> oxalate. So, but it does contain calcium. Mm. 
Um, but the, the real, I would say, the take-home message is I think volume is the most important thing. Mm-hmm. So I don't think people should um, should need, feel they need to spend money um, on expensive bottled water, particularly when I'm saying drink more of it. You've got to drink two or three liters. Well, it's yeah. quite expensive every day, isn't it? Yeah, so yeah. it's actually volume that is important. And I, I think we're going to probably come on and talk about calcium next. But actually, yeah. calcium is important in the diet. Mm. Um, and you don't, and low calcium also increases your risk of stones. So actually, the calcium you're getting in hard water may be important for a lot of uh, the listeners with just general yeah. occasional stones. Yeah. It may actually be important that they are getting that calcium. Yeah. There will be some people who have high calcium in the urine where maybe you do not want to be, you want to have lower calcium diets. And maybe there, that is when soft water is more important. But I think those are the people who are, should be being picked up in a hospital and being advised um, mm. through a, through a, like a metabolic stone clinic or a urologist yeah. or a nephrologist. So, that I, so I think for, for general people who don't know that they're in that situation, um, I think it doesn't really matter what type of water, it's just the volume. Yeah, yeah. I think um, it, it's kind of reassuring. There have been studies on this as well. So people have looked at the different types of uh, water uh, or fluid and uh, it doesn't make a difference in your stone output. Mm. But um, was, we were just saying this earlier, actually, that it does look like some of the, the fluid that you drink, like the, the water, for example, if you were drinking mineral water or certain types of tap water can make a difference to your actual uh, amount of calcium, for example, in your urine, yeah. then it could be potentially buffered more. Mm. Um, so maybe that's why you don't form stones. We were saying this earlier, weren't we? But um, yeah. Uh, yeah. So essentially, those studies have looked at that, and it doesn't look like it's increasing your stones. So just like yeah, Matt was saying, it's about quantity, really, isn't it? Yeah, and people have done big, big studies, big population studies, mm. looking at hard water versus soft water areas, see if they have more stones. And the answer is they don't. Yeah. So you can look at their urine, and you will see that their calcium will go up slightly. Yeah. But as I just said, maybe that's a good thing. But maybe mm. it's also buffered by an increase in citrate in the urine. So that's an, and citrate's an inhibitor of stones. Mm. So so overall, when you look at the hard end point of do you make more stones if you live in a mm. hard water area compared to soft water area, the studies have said you don't. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about <laughs> alkaline water now, because <laughs> that's the other thing. The We're list. definitely get asked about alkaline yeah. water, whether it alkalizes, uh, alkalinizes the urine. Actually, I was doing a little bit of research and I typed in alkaline water on YouTube mm. and there's uh, a YouTuber who's literally tested all the different types of water that's uh, um, mm, uh, yeah. marketed as alkaline to see whether it is actually even alkaline. And a lot of them are just... <laughs> Just normal, like neutral compared to tap water. Oh wow! It's interesting. Yeah, mm. yeah. But you, you, you had some thoughts on uh, alkaline water. Well, um, just because when we were sort of planning, we mentioned this before. Mm-hmm. Um, I thought I'd look it up, and the uh, the one that I looked up anyway, the couple that I looked up didn't have the same uh, ingredients that we we would use to alkalize the urine, which is something that we do sometimes suggest. Yeah. So um, I think on that point, uh, then I, I suspect it wouldn't be as as useful for stone reduction. Mm. Um, so that's the the thought I had. And also, I don't think they would have the same quantities, but I didn't know that. They'd yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's not yeah. Alkaline, I, I, it, might, it could have been like a sample it. issue. Yeah. I mean, who knows? But yeah, but alkaline mm. water, not worth your money. I, I don't think so. I think, but, you know, we can't say that for sure, I suppose, without testing. Uh, yeah, so I think we just, sometimes in our, in our clinic, we do, if people do want to look at bottled waters, you can look at the amount of bicarbonate. So this okay. is a slightly different thing, but you can look at the amount of bicarbonate on the label. Mm-hmm. So you can compare them. And then ideally you probably want a, if you're choosing bottled water, something with a higher bicarbonate level, mm-hmm. but with a mm. relatively low sodium level. And they will go, and they, they could both go up together, in which case that's not necessarily good for you either. So yeah. high, higher bicarbonate, lower sodium, if you're choosing one. Yep. That's diff- slightly different from alkaline waters, which are being marketed. Yes. I don't think it's such a problem in this country at the moment. I know it is a huge issue in America. Yeah. Um, mm. And there's um, a friend who's a professor of nephrology in New York, we've had over to London a couple of times, mm, I think you've probably yeah. seen him speak. Yeah. Um, I've spoken to him about it and he has a real bugbear about it because actually really? that does alkaline water, doesn't matter what that is, it does, it, it's all to do with the free bicarbonate in water. So it's got nothing to do with how someone is marketing it as alkaline water. So that isn't probably influencing the acidity of your urine at all. Mm. And therefore it's no beneficial for stones and you're spending a lot of money doing it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I wanted to get on this a bit later actually, but um, just walk me through, if someone has a stone or maybe has had two stones, mm. what what would the management of that person be in terms of looking at their urine? Would we be sending off their urine for analysis mm. to look at uh, how their urine is faring over, over a 24 hour period? And is that something that's so the norm? Generally once they're clear of stones is when you might do more of an in de- in-depth screen. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, beyond like basic blood tests yeah. uh, and you generally should be sort of risk stratifying people which we there's no sort of formal way of doing that I think but it's a, 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 a that we particularly use but it's a sort of rough 
guide uh, of like the particularly high risk people, for example, if they've got one kidney or they're forming really frequent stones. Um, and then you might go into an in, in depth um, uh, analysis of, of why that might be happening with blood mm -hmm. tests and with um, a urine collection. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, I don't think you want to add into that, Matt. Yeah, so if you try to identify mm. high risk stone formers, you normally talk about the very young. So anyone oh, under yeah, 18 yeah. Mm. should definitely be investigated for gotcha. a metabolic cause because that mm -hmm. is not normal. Uh -huh. um, um, the, the EAU guidelines sort of suggest anyone under 30, mm. anyone with bilateral stones, if you're getting stones in both kidneys, yeah. then that's a yeah. higher risk uh -huh. formation of big stones. So a staghorn mm. stone would, would, would drive that. Mm -hmm. Um, possibly a very strong family history as well. So there yeah. are reasons why you might look more in depth. Mm -hmm. I mean, as a general screen, most people will, will have looked at the other kidneys to know that, the, well, both kidneys to know that there aren't any other stones. Yep. Mm. We should be doing a blood test on everybody so we know what the kidney function is, but yeah. also know what the calcium and the uric acid or urate levels are mm -hmm. in the urine. That should be a minimum that everybody should, should have had yep. if mm -hmm. they've had a stone episode before. Mm -hmm. Beyond that, it's more complex. Gotcha. Mm. And the way that we tend to screen people is with these big, Fluid collections, urine yeah. collections, 24, 48 hours. You get given these big things Massive. to carry around. Yeah. Yeah, jerry cans. Got to f um, <laughs> yeah. And they can be very frustrating to do. You've got to bring them back. Yeah. They've got to be sent off. Often they get, <laughs> they get mislabeled, they get lost, yeah. they get spilled. Yeah. Um, and I would say, a lot, in my experience, a lot of the time it is all normal. So you do all that effort yeah. mm. and it's normal. So you've got to be, I think you've got to try and find the right patient. The, the one who's making coming back to you every couple of years, another stone. Yeah. You, you want to be looking, is there anything else we can find in them that is beyond diet? So yeah. you're finding yeah. another cause. So mm -hmm. yeah. you know, uh, um, high parathyroid or hyperparathyroidism mm -hmm. is a yep. cause. Mm -hmm. That's why we do the blood test for calcium, yeah. um, other yeah. things. So those are, the those are the people you want to identify. So you can offer, offer diff tailored advice, maybe some drugs to try and reduce their risk. Yeah, mm. yeah. Absolutely. We, we've alluded to this already, uh, so we might as well talk about it now. Calcium. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I was telling you before, I did a little poll of my, not a formal poll, but like a little poll of some of my yes. colleagues mm. in primary care and actually in secondary care as well, uh, some any &E colleagues. And uh, I asked them about whether we should be restricting calcium in the diet if someone is having frequent stones. And the majority of people said yes. But that's not necessarily the case. In fact, that's the opposite of what we should be doing in the majority of people, right? In terms of dietary restriction to reduce the recurrence of, of stones. Yeah, it's, it seems counterintuitive because some of the other things that are in stones, we, we might we'll be talking about, you may be able to reduce through your diet. But calcium, you've you've got a huge amount of calcium in your body, the first thing to say, really, because yeah. your bones and your teeth uh, are all calcium. So um, the amount that you eat is not necessarily representative of the, your store of calcium. Mm -hmm. But therefore, if you start to lower the amount that you're eating you might end up reabsorption more of the the calcium that's from your bones and your teeth causing issues that way mm -hmm. um it can actually put uh, because of your hormone pathway as well can put the calcium in your urine up mm. um so it can have a the sort of counterintuitive effect where you then end up having more stones because of that so calcium's um something to just have in your normal diet and to have a sort of normal amounts if you have even if you have calcium stones but you're you're right it's, yeah. <laughs> it's something yeah. that people might want to go to and reducing the diet and that would be the wrong thing to do in this case yeah yeah. 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 And studies have looked at it, haven't they? Studies mm. have looked at trying to compare two groups, two randomized groups between a low calcium diet and a high and a normal calcium yeah. diet. Yeah. And the people with low calcium diet had an increased risk of stone formation. Mm. Mm. So so people should definitely not I tell people not to cut back on dairy particularly unless you have a lot. Mm. And then of course yeah. it's working out what that means. Yeah. yeah. And you know, I, I'm a urologist, I'm not I don't no. feel I'm in a position to really scrutinize someone's diet and say how much you're getting, how much milk, how much yeah. cheese, other sources of calcium. Yeah. You know, if you really want that depth, you probably need to see a dietitian or a nutritionist, I would have thought. Mm. Yeah. But as a general rule, don't cut back on dairy and you want to have a normal amount, which is something like a thousand milligrams a day for yeah. Yeah. for most adults. Yeah. It goes up a little bit as, as you get older. Mm. Yeah, get older, there's a but. there's a cut off like after when the risk of osteoporosis increases, that's when yeah. you want to increase it to one point two grams per day mm -hmm. or one thousand two hundred milligrams. But in the in most adults it's around a, a thousand milligrams. Yeah. Uh, and there's a relationship with oxalate as well, right? So if you're restricting calcium, that changes the oxalate absorption, which can increase the risk of calcium oxalate stones. Yeah, so most, most we said most common types of the stones are calcium oxalate. That's probably what most mm. people have got. Mm. Um, oxalate is often the bad party in that rather than the calcium. We, get, we don't get all like oxalate, but some of it comes from, the, from the, it can be in the diet. If you, and what it does, calcium, if you have it together, calcium and oxalate actually bind in the gut and then comes out in our, in our feces. 
if you mm. don't have the calcium, the oxalate is left unbound mm. and gets absorbed in the gut. And then you, so you do increase mm. your amount of oxalate in your blood, which can then come out in the urine, mm. that binds to calcium again and forms your calcium oxalate stone. Stones, yeah. Yeah. But that's why, counterintuitively, you want to have a normal calcium intake to bind the calcium in the gut before... The oxalate, yeah. The oxalate, yeah. sorry, in the gut before, before it can be absorbed. Yeah, mm. we'll talk about oxalates in general, actually, in terms of whether a low oxalate diet is mm. useful or whether it's recommended uh, but we're going to stick to the general advice for now because i want to keep keep people on, on this journey mm. um <laughs> salt <laughs> uh, or sodium yeah. uh, specifically uh w- what are our thoughts on on sodium restriction as, as general advice for so general advice is uh that you reduce the amount of sodium in your diet um and you reduce the amount of essentially calcium in your urine so uh it's good for Basically, I guess it's generally good for your cardiovascular health anyway. It's better to have less salt, sodium chloride in your diet for other health reasons as well. But for uh, calcium forming stones, then it's mm. going to, uh, you know, potentially help. Yeah. So I think that's good advice. And we'd say that to everyone. In- yeah, for sure. And the mechanism mm. is that in the kidneys, sodium and calcium go out together. Yeah. yeah. So if you've got more salt, more sodium, sorry, yeah. uh, that, that then goes out as a, with the same transporter as calcium. So it puts yeah. more calcium out in the urine yeah. to then increase your risk of getting a calcium stone. Yeah. So that's the mechanism for that. Yeah. So it makes sense. So everyone would advise to have mm-hmm. a low salt diet. Yeah. I think in our diet sheet at, at Guys, we say six grams a day. I think yes. some say less than three grams a day. Mm. But the principle is salt is bad for, for the body, bad for blood pressure, bad, as you say, for other yeah. cardiovascular risk factors. So, mm. you know, I think everybody should be trying to follow a low salt diet. And there can be a lot of s- sneaky salt in diets, can't there? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and if, yeah. if I, if, th- the issue I find with salt in general and the conversation around salt is that most of the salt is coming from processed foods, mm. which has got a lot of sugar in, a lot of other additives, a lot of things that can be harmful for the gut, which are all sort of like conspiring uh, to disrupt your cardiovascular system and, and sort of cause all sorts of like inflammatory issues. Mm. Um, and I was gonna ask about that actually, because in terms of some of the diet sheets that I've seen, they've recommended five to six grams, which is basically what the British Heart Foundation recommends as well. Some of them were quite low, so two to three grams, which is really, is there any, mm. uh, are there specific examples where a very low, uh, a highly restricted sodium diet is, is useful for particular stones, or is that just, are they, are they just trying to be a bit more aggressive with the management? I think probably the uh, evidence would suggest as low as possible. So if you, uh-huh. so you say go aggressive. Yeah. Like, like we said, again, it's got to be livable. This is a lifetime risk. Yeah. Mm. About. This yeah. isn't just do it for a year and then, then you can stop it. It's got yeah. to be, so it's got to be doable, hasn't it? So, yeah. yeah. But it's useful for people to go away and just try and work out how much salt they are getting. You know, I think how that's much processed useful. food, yeah. how much fast food, yeah. all this, the salt. You, you know, people can say, oh, yeah, I've stopped putting on my food. But actually, where are you getting it in other sources? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We, we, we've also touched on this, but um, one of the recommendations was exercise, but as it pertains to weight loss rather than the exercise itself. So having a n- normal quote unquote quote weight or making sure mm. that you're not obese or have metabolic issues so i think it, it, obesity is linked with stones so mm-hmm. but it probably is a bit multifactorial as some of the other dietary things we might come on to in a minute yeah. um but uh so that uh, my understanding is that generally yeah exercise will uh, uh reduce your weight which is then going to have a knock-on effect in, in terms of reducing stones obviously the rest of your health benefits that we know about yeah um i suppose with stone formers as we said the important thing is then to be maintaining that uh fluid output or urine output still because when you're exercising you're going to probably dehydrate yourself a bit more so you get mm. the balance right mm-hmm. um but yeah that, that's my thoughts on weight loss more and do you, do yeah. you think an exercise that? contributes to an overall healthy lifestyle doesn't it yeah, yeah. you know if you're someone who exercises regularly you're probably you're probably not having burger and chips once a day because <laughs> 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 it's part of your health it's what you're doing it's part of a healthy lifestyle isn't it and yeah you're yeah. regulating your weight and then weight is as you say obesity is linked with yeah, so increased risk of kidney well, the, stones. So. There's quite a few CrossFitters who love uh, a low carb keto diet, so <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and th- that brings me nicely onto the oh, next yeah, uh, the the next part of the general advice, which is protein mm. uh, in general. And but we're specifically talking about protein from animal products. Um, is that right? Yeah, so <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit of a contentious yeah. subject, I think, yeah. because you know some people are like, well, I need quality protein in my mm. diet. You know, it's, it's useful for uh, the exercise I'm, I'm doing, uh, osteoporosis, you know, uh, after menopause, particularly mm. people are quite um, uh, cognizant of the amount of protein in their diet for their health benefits. Yeah. Um, however, a high protein diet with too much of the purines and methionine mm. can contribute to stones. Is that? Yeah, I think um, 
animal protein in particular has a, it's important obviously to have protein in your diet, but if you have um, animal protein, which includes uh, supplements that may be derived from animal, for example, uh, products like dairy, so whey protein and so mm -hmm. on, then uh, the issues there are um, to do with acidifying your urine um, as a result of the uh, amino acids in that. So um, that's quite specific to high levels of animal protein in your diet, and that, that can increase your risk of those types of, of, of stones yeah. uh, from the acidification point of view. Mm -hmm. Um, I guess we can't really say, therefore, that you should have lots of vegan protein instead, but yeah. you know, you could eliminate that to improve your sort of risk factor from that yeah. side. Yeah. Yeah. Protein is important. Getting enough protein yeah. is important, isn't it? That's a message we give in our system in your clinic. Yeah. In for mm -hmm. children, we don't, they don't limit their protein, protein. intake at all because it's yeah. important for growth. Mm. Uh, but in adults, I mean, uh, you know, we talked about why people are getting stones, Western diets. How mm. common was 100 years ago? How common was meat on a, on a table? Probably yeah. very rare, probably yeah. a real mm. treat. Now, most people probably do it every day and just yeah. view it out as routine, isn't it? So yeah. there is a problem, yeah. I would say, with animal protein. We're having too much. Yeah. Um, and so and it's been linked, as you say, it acidifies the urine, linked with mm. calcium oxalate stone formation, uric acid mm -hmm. stone formation, which are two of the big common types of stones we talked about. Yeah. Yeah. So people, you know, the general advice is to try and cut back on animal protein. I, tend, I try to tell patients to have one or two vegetarian days a week. So you know, it doesn't say you mm. can't enjoy life, you can't mm. enjoy a steak. But just be aware of that. That, mm. that is increase, one of those things that does increase your risk. Yeah. And actually, maybe it's fun to try and cook at home and do a vegetarian. One Every Wednesday is a vegetarian mm. day. Something like that, just that makes it fun as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Are vegetarians less... I haven't looked at this, so I'll probably have to go and do some research. But mm. are vegetarians less likely to have stones for, for that reason? Or is it is it not yeah, shown so in the I, data? I don't know if it's specifically vegetarians, but the vegetarian diet in general will have more alkaline urine. Yeah. So that's we know that's beneficial, as we've said, you know, alkalization of the urine is uh -huh. protective. So from that point of view, yes. Yeah. I think that's uh, that will be protective. Yeah. Uh -huh. So fruit yeah. and vegetables are good. So fruit yeah. and vegetables yeah. are positive <laughs> animal protein. Yeah. Yeah. Fruit and vegetables yeah. cause alkalization yeah. of your urine. Uh -huh. So um, so it stands to reason there that it's following a, mm. a a typical vegetarian diet rather than a high animal protein diet yeah. will is the sort of diet we're trying to say to stone forms you yeah. should be having. So yeah. so yes. I think is the answer to that. Yeah, yeah. And I, I guess it also increases your fiber consumption as well, which reduces your absorption of, of calcium uh, in, in yeah, the gut. Yeah, the fiber yeah. is good, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Let's talk about the urine mm. alkalinization and acidification uh, a, 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 as it relates mm. to, to stones. What, what do we mean by, by this? Because uh, I th there's there are a bunch of uh, diets out there uh, over the last you know couple of decades that have, have you know claimed to alkalinize your body mm. and i think there is a sort of implied it, 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 it's sort of implied that it changes your blood ph level which you know mm. it, as, as we all know is, is not going to happen mm -hmm. um so what do we mean by by urine alkalization and, and acidification well um in general terms what, for what we mean uh when we do it it's sort of for, for stone patients mm -hmm. is that you are uh, giving medication to achieve that rather than just doing it through purely through your diet mm -hmm. um, and typically it'd be something like potassium citrate that they're taking um and you can have strategies for doing that but then that's sort of taking it through the day that en ends up uh with them having alkaline urine compared to the normal ph for urine mm -hmm. um so that that's what we mean sort of in general terms for us if that's mm -hmm. like a kind of broad view and then obviously like we said for most stones that's going to reduce your risk i mean the, the exceptions we said like already we mentioned those sort of struvite type yeah. of stones uh and pure calcium phosphate stones as well so you wouldn't do it for those types but everything else will pretty much uh have a benefit from that yeah and i suppose to explain that slightly differently the, yeah. the ph of the body the urine mm. is actually quite a tight range it's between yeah. 5.5 and 8 yeah. whereas you can buy ph strips that measure from Nought or one to fourteen. Mm. Actually, you're not going to get. You don't get urine. It can't. Mm. It's not physiologically possible to have a urine at pH three or no. or yeah. thirteen, fourteen. So it's quite a tight range. Yeah. Mm. Um, and so what we tend to see is in the more acidic urine, so that's on the sort of five, five point five, maybe six level. You increase your risk of getting calcium oxalate and uric acid stones. Mm -hmm. If you can get that level, num that pH level up mm -hmm. to more like six point five seven, mm -hmm. then you significantly reduce that. Yeah. And in fact, with uric acid, you can actually dissolve them. So you, you, you really do prevent it by getting there because mm. because actually it moves out the, the uric acid sort of dissociation point in the urine mm -hmm. so that it's fully dissolved if you mm. can re reliably achieve about 6.5 to 7. You can have amazing results with like really big stones, uric acid stones. Oh, wow. Just yeah, be dissolved. Dissolve. It's the only type yeah. of stone you can dissolve. So patients often mm. ask that, can you dissolve yeah. this stone? So yeah. yes, in yes. a situation that Very is specific. uric acid. Yeah. Yeah. But that does happen. And we have mm. seen that, with, as you say, with complete staghorn stones that can 
that mm. can be dissolved. Interesting. Um, and then just finally to say, sort of, I mean, I was saying, talk a lot about cysteine year and cysteine stones. Yeah, but that's good. another one where actually the more alkaline you can make it, the more it gets dissolved in, in the urine. Uh-huh. Uh, so we actually aim for even higher then, which is more like 7.5 to 8. Oh, mm. right. Um, and if you, people can achieve that, then that, that does significantly reduce the amount of, cyst- of uh, solid cysteine in the urine. So that obviously reduces your risk of stone formation. The risk with all of this is if you get it too high, mm-hmm. you then can precipitate calcium phosphate, which you just mentioned, mm, yeah. why you wouldn't do it. Yeah. So yeah. In, in situations where you have a calcium phosphate stone, you do not want to be up in the, you don't want to be over alkalizing the urine and getting up to eight, 8.5, anything like that. Yeah, so, that's right. But again, for the majority of people listening, that is not you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. you know, for the majority of people, you know, that you would, you, if you're getting that and getting it regularly, you're going to be under a urologist, under a stone clinic, yeah. mm. and you're going to know that's your type of stone. So yeah. most people are going to have calcium oxalate stones. Yeah. Uh, on that note, uh, is there any rationale for somebody who has recurrent stones to check the pH of their urine on a weekly basis? We're using a strip, we're using a strip. They're very easily, you know, yeah. purchasable. You know, it costs a few quid. I suppose it'd be useful to. I mean, I've not ever suggested it to anyone, but uh, it'd be useful to know. Obviously, <laughs> I think for someone who's had one or two yeah. stones and worried about yeah. about stones for the future, it probably isn't mm. uh-huh. um, particularly useful. Because I think you just want to follow. It's more important mm. to just focus on the things we talked about. So yeah. focus on fluid. Yeah. Focus on just a healthy diet, low salt, mm. mixing up the diet, not too much animal, all of that. Yeah. Rather than go, oh look, my pH is five point five, or my pH mm. is seven. Yeah. What does that mean in for someone who's had a stone every five years? Yeah. That yeah. probably doesn't mean anything at all. Yeah. I mean, we do give. Um, I do advise people to test their urine. So if they've got uric acid stones, you want to, al- mm. and we're deliberately alkalizing their urine in the stone clinic. Yeah. We get everyone to try and measure their their urine pH mm. uh-huh. either with dipsticks or with pH meters, and actually we did a little study on that, and you can buy really cheap pH meters on Amazon, say, yeah, yeah. for about 10, 15 pounds, which are just as reliable as pH meters strips, that, are, yeah. that, are, that are 100 pounds, and probably mm. more accurate than strips and stuff, or, oh, okay. or it's certainly comparable, but much easier to do, because otherwise the strips you're looking yeah, at. Yeah, you're always going, looking yeah. at the that, that, that shade of green or that shade <laughs> of green, yeah, yeah. And, you're not, and you're not sure, was this just gives you a, a very yeah, accurate answer, digital yeah. reading. So, yeah. um, mm. so for those patients, um, yes, uh, definitely, definitely is useful, and we get all our cysteine patients to do it, obviously. But again, mm. that's that's a, a niche, uh, a niche group of patients. And, and just to clarify, mm. you'd be <coughs> alkalinizing the urine using medications in those instances, or is it would would it be through diet as well? So, so well, the principles of diet are, f- are yeah. there, and people should be doing it anyway. Sure. But mm. yeah, we, we're alkalinizing the urine deliberately, yeah, because mm. they because they've got a uric acid stone that either you don't want, they keep getting it and you want to prevent it, so you yep. get the urine pH up, or or you're dissolving it, yeah. or in cysteine, something like that, where you're, and the, so yes, we're deliberately giving medications there to alkalize their urine, and we want to check that the medications are actually having the desired mm. effect. Because there's no point giving the medication, and it's not making any difference to the pH, so mm. you, you need to know in that situation. Yeah. So with that, with those pH meters, did you find that, because I've not seen that before, they, whether, was their pH varying a lot during like a weekly basis for those patients, or? Um, it does fluctuate a lot during the day, yeah. Mm. So uh, it's got a lot to do with what we eat and drink, not surprisingly. Mm. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. It, is, it is fascinating. We've had a couple of patients who look really in depth at this in our cysteine. Yeah. They're, they're a very driven group of patients to, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, to look at this and done some amazing diaries of every single time for a few weeks they've done it. If you have a steak, you can see that the pH goes down. Interesting. You know, if you have a beer, it goes mm. down a bit. But um, And then they just drink more water and it comes up a bit and you can see. <laughs> so that one in particular, that, I'm, that patient in particular I'm talking about, really mm. showed beautifully the effect yeah. the diet can have. Yeah. And, and he was then compensating. And then he stopped doing it, but he mm. says, I now know what I'm doing. Yeah. So I'm still going to enjoy a steak, but I know I'm going to drink more water when I do it because yes. I know it's going to cause my my urine pH to dip. I think that's a really important mm. point, actually, because all these things are just tools that give yeah. us a bit more granularity on how we are reacting to what we eat and drink. Mm. So it's the same thing with like continuous glucose monitors. It's just a tool. Yeah. A lot of people, I think, can go a bit too in depth with it and just eat fat, for example, which is just going to keep your glucose level completely flat, mm. the, you know, as long as it's fat with no sugar in. Um, but that's not going to be a, a good strategy long. Yeah. long having that you want to have all the other elements in your diet so this i think is it's good to do for a little while to see how you react but not necessarily something that you want to get overly i think that's right it's a kind of understanding tool isn't it as well yeah but i think that's i mean uh, that is why we kind of risk stratify a little bit when we're deciding treatment so not everyone is going to have that full in-depth like extensive blood work and metabolic yeah. you know, stone screen yeah. um, because it's just not necessary because stones are, like we just said are so common you get mm. one in ten one in eight people having them in their life 
Um, and that might just be their one stone that they have. It, mm. You know, then they maybe add a bit more fluid into the diet or whatever, and, it, and it, you don't need to kind of, you know, go crazy chasing yeah. your urine pH every day or every like throughout the day. Whereas mm. for that, the sort of cysteine patients you mentioned that where they are doing it, that could be really relevant because that will help them balance it out. And yeah. yeah. Um, reduce the risk. Green juices are really popular. <laughs> green juice. <laughs> Particularly <laughs> raw green juices. Yeah. Where you have literally like a bag of kale, a bag of spinach. Every now and then, mm. like all good. But some people will have this every single day. Are they putting themselves at risk of stones given what we just talked about with regard to the fact that it's high in oxalates, but it's also going to alkalinize your, your urine as well? Yeah, so we're, that's a nice segue into oxalates. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there, yeah, it is, the yeah, yeah. Juice angle. <laughs> Good question. Huh? I've yeah. never been asked that question. No, exactly. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, so yeah. Ox should we talk about oxalates? Yeah, yeah let's, let's talk about, talk about oxalates. oxalates. Yeah, yeah. Exactly, yeah. So, so oxalates, yeah. common type, common, most common type of stone, calcium yeah. oxalate. So, but only about 10 to 15% of oxalate comes from the diet. So, most mm. of it's made by the body. So, 85% of it you can't do anything about. So, that's mm. number one. So. Yeah. Um, you can look online and find huge lists of. Yeah. Um, foods that have got different and oxalate levels and break it down into high, medium, low, etc. Yeah. But a lot of the stuff that you find in those lists is actually really healthy stuff. Mm. So spinach, mm. yeah. you mentioned then, is one of the ones that is actually on the particularly high end of the spectrum with oxalates. But it's healthy in other ways. Mm -hmm. and fruit and vegetables are good mm. and they help to alkalize the urine. And yeah. So I tend to, people, they tend to tell people that they can have a look at that list. If you have any one of those in particularly high quantities, mm -hmm every day so all, all, all the time then you might want to just moderate that yeah mm -hmm. but that, that doesn't mean you have to cut it all out because otherwise you're cutting out a lot of very healthy things as well so. yeah but again it's just yeah. about awareness i think you know life's there to be enjoyed if you enjoy eating that and it's healthy yeah then uh then yeah. then do it but just be aware of what that's doing and maybe just drink more water with that so if i'm going to have something that's high mm. in oxalate well i'll just drink some more water to counterbalance that mm. it's, it's a sort of general advice i try to give rather than people going oh yeah i've cut this out cut this out cut this out yeah cut steak out you're like well yeah what, what are you, yeah, what, yeah, what are you, yeah, what are you yeah. eating yeah i yeah. think that's it because you can I, in general terms as well everything else is a bit easy because you can yeah. say look water drink lots we've told you the strategy salt yeah. you've got to reduce that protein you've got to reduce that and then you come to oxalates mm. and people are like you know generally the public and the patients won't know what that is and i don't think i would unless uh, you know i did this job and looked into it and yeah. like you say the list is it, it's lots of fruits, vegetables, nuts, sesame seeds for some reason, you know, soy products as well. Mm. Um, so uh, it's a really broad spectrum of things. And I think that's uh, most of the advice would be avoid excessive consumption. Yeah. Because your body produces oxalates anyway. And, in, you know, it's involved in other um, metabolism, like we've said. So there will still be oxalates there regardless of what you do with your diet. But if you are forming lots of uh, calcium oxalate stones and you do have an excessive amount of one of those things, then it is something to look at and reduce yeah well, where's uh, most of the oxalate helpful. coming from you mentioned it earlier um well it, it's kind of a byproduct of like respiration essentially in, in your body so you're 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 making it anyway mm -hmm. um but there is a certain amount that's coming through your diet as well yeah was, i looked through um, these lists and yeah. this is basically what i use to make all my recipes <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. so it's got it's got nuts yeah. sesame seeds peanut butter some fruit tangerines plums rhubarb soy products like a, yeah. a lot of stuff and and i guess uh, we were talking about this before uh, before in terms of if you have a moderate oxalate consumption and you're reducing your calcium levels that's going to increase your risk of uh, calcium oxalate yeah. stones as well so it yeah it's just something to to bear in mind i guess mm. yeah bear it in mind but don't yeah. go crazy with it and yeah um there's a there's a uh, lady i'll give a shout out to her christina peniston who's a <laughs> dietitian in wisconsin who, yeah. who i know quite well and also had over to london recently and gave us a gave a talk at the, the royal society of medicine oh, mm -hmm. brilliant. um and she's just written an article saying don't cut back on oxalate yeah. <laughs> she's a dietitian because yeah. that's you know because of because of actually all the benefits in most of those that mm. foodstuffs that you get yeah look at the other bits look at the animal protein bit of it yeah you know look at the balancing thing is to sort that bit out, not to not to cut back on what is what is largely healthy stuff. So yeah. I think you're okay with all your <laughs> yeah, with yeah, all the yeah, exactly. That's great. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sell the book. yeah. Um, <laughs> vitamin C and oxalates uh, oh, yeah. is that something people? I mean, vitamin C has become very popular mm. post COVID as well. well. I think it's interesting actually because in general, in your your medical history, I, I've not really asked about vitamins or supplements yeah. before, um, but. Uh, I guess more look, reading around for this talk as well, mm. looking into vitamin C. And um, essentially a lot of people, like you say, having high dose vitamin C, it's a precursor for oxalates. So they may be unwittingly sort of putting a lot of oxalates into their diet. Mm -hmm. 
And if, if you're having over like a gram and some people are having like three grams a day, then they're going to definitely uh, raise the amount of oxalates in the body and probably in the urine. Mm. Um, probably okay for most people. But again, then if you are forming calcium oxygen stains, that might be the reason why, or that yeah. might be contributing to it. Yeah. So Something I think, to be aware of, I guess. Yeah, it's, it's a good thing to be aware of. Yeah, I haven't got much to add to that, but yeah. definitely yeah. vitamin C intake being correlated with increased risk of kidney stones, calcium yeah. oxalate kidney stones. Yeah, so and it's not something we usually ask about, or I have not until no. now. Um, and you may not be told what drugs do you take. You don't. Yeah, you just don't say. Yeah, oh, yeah. say supplements. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, exactly. Those things. So yeah, so it is the high dose, isn't it? It's five hundred mm. or greater. You know, kind of how, how yeah. high? Like five hundred milligrams. Oh, okay. Those yeah. or greater. Because it's yeah. something like you need about 60 milligrams of vitamin C a day. That's normal, right. But th there are some normal some sort of recommended like up to a gram or even more. Like yeah. you know, I've seen before. So one to four grams is what people have been taking yeah. as, a, as an antiviral sort of dose. Yeah. Um, so yeah, pretty high, pretty up there. Mm. Um, yeah, but if if you if you've never made a stone, I think you probably keep going with what you're doing, don't you? Yeah. yeah a lot of stones you're making ox calcium oxalate stones in particular. Then you probably should look at that and work out what the risk benefit ratio is because there's yeah. definitely a risk to taking it. Yeah. So where's your benefit? You know, where's the actual evidence that taking those high doses is beneficial? Yeah. 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 Um, we were talking earlier a bit about um, the uh, overly acidic urine being the main risk factor for uric acid stones. Um, when people think of uric acid, they think allopurinol, uh, which is a medication mm. that we use for gout. Has that been shown to be effective at all, or is that is that old-fashioned yeah. advice? No, allopurinol is very effective at lowering your uric acid in your your sort of blood, mm. particularly. Mm. And I think as a knock-on, then it will help with your urine. Um, but I don't think it, it specifically lowers the urine uh, uric acid. Okay, um, that's my understanding of it. Um, but yeah, definitely, if your your uric acid is high in your, in your bloodstream, then you you would be suggesting that. Yeah, mm. and that's why I want that's one of those mandatory blood tests I said earlier. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uric acid or urate. To yeah. Mm -hmm. that. So, um, so yeah, if you're getting gout and you've got a high urate and you've got a uric acid stone, then I think it's a no-brainer. You should be on. Mm. You should probably you'll be advised to take allopurinol. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure a lot of people have very with uric acid stones necessarily mm. have high urate levels. So if if the blood level yeah. is normal then there is no benefit no benefit yeah. taking yeah. allopurinol gotcha so but there is clear benefit to alkalization of the urine yeah and as i say if you can you can reach yes. a certain level where it will be fully dissolved yeah if you yeah. if you can achieve that that yeah. level of alkalization i feel like i'm going to have like a green salad and check the <laughs> ph of my <laughs> yeah. urine i've never done that before <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but yeah. just out of interest <laughs> no, i think it would be because there no there are no symptoms of like if you were to mm. have a steak or you know beer and um, whatever there aren't any specific symptoms of acidic urine are there I'm assuming that we're not doing it long term we have a stone no Just no you won't, no. You wouldn't no, know you wouldn't know, you wouldn't know at all never know yeah. yeah yeah okay great uh any other specific dietary factors for specific types of stones before we move on to supplements uh i think that's yeah i mean I've got what have we done um, drinks, different types of drinks we haven't talked about. Oh, yeah, let's talk mm. about that. Good, yeah. yes. good drinks, bad drinks. Yeah, 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 tea, coffee, fizzy drinks. Yeah, let's talk about that. Um, so it doesn't have to be water. Yeah, so yeah. <laughs> water's boring. Yeah, yeah. People ask um, about beer. I like obviously. water. <laughs> <laughs> you can definitely yeah. flavor it, yeah. number mm -hmm. one. Um, you know, that's absolutely fine. And like we keep saying, it's the volume that's important, really. Yeah. Um, one way of flavoring it, which is good, is to put lemons in it. Mm -hmm. So... Yeah. Um, lemons is a very natural way of alkalizing your urine. Uh -huh. And I quite commonly say to patients to squeeze, and there is evidence for this, to squeeze mm. the juice of one or two whole lemons per day into a liter of water. So get a big liter jug, yeah. squeeze one or two whole mm. lemons in, uh -huh. and then drink that as your, throughout the day as your, as your fluid. Interesting. And you're getting the benefits of all that citrate from the, from the yeah. lemons naturally, which will alkalize your urine. And, and it's a way of flavoring it as well. So yeah. that's a really good thing to do. To be really sort of geeky on this, I tried to look into this and to see what, like, <laughs> whether that was good <laughs> advice or not. And because I've, I've definitely heard it throughout, and I, I've said to people as well, whether it's a few drops or like two lemons. Uh -huh. um, but I think what, what I tend to eventually see was essentially that the citrate may end up um, becoming more of a like a bicarb buffer because it's because uh, I was thinking actually a citrate is something that you drink like the lemon juice citrate they're going to end up in your your urine or not because that's obviously citrate is a buffer in your urine that we we're hoping mm. will help but um I think it looks like probably through metabolism it's not going to end up there but um but it, it, but will, it increases the bicarbonate it will increase so the you're bicarb. right because exactly. citrate is a yeah. stone inhibitor naturally in the urine yeah. Yeah. lemons and things like that don't or potassium that's right. citrate yeah. potassium citrate either don't increase your citrate 
I can be corrected. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So yeah. an expert that's on right. this, yeah. but they yeah. don't increase your citrate level specifically uh -huh. urine, but they mm. but uh, but they increase the bicarbonate, and by increasing the bicarbonate, yeah. that increase that causes your citrate to go higher in the urine. Yeah, because right. It's, so that's the mechanism. So I had that. a moment where I was like, oh, I shouldn't be yeah. um, suggesting lemon juice, and then I went back to oh, yeah, no, you should. Good, yeah. but for another yeah. reason. So yeah, for yeah, yeah, exactly. But the mechanism is through bicarbonate, which is why your citrate goes up in the urine. Yeah. So. Yeah, agreed. Not that it just goes through the body and suddenly comes out as the yeah, lemon citrate, juice. Yeah, exactly. and, so how could yeah. that Is that the same uh, for yeah. all citrus fruits then, like uh, limes or grapefruit, or or do, is it specifically lemons? Yeah, I, no, I, I people, people say specifically lemons. People have looked at that. I think lemons and things. limes are equally yeah. good ish. Okay. Equally ish. Mm. Uh -huh. um, grapefruit, I think, is okay. Probably not. Mm -hmm. I think lemons and limes are the best. Uh -huh. yeah. Orange, less so, but. Uh -huh. You do read different things and get different mm. different take home messages from stuff. So some people say that some certain uh, like fruit juices and things, and I guess you're going to come onto it as well, could be harmful because of like the other side effects with having like more acidity and so on. So right, okay. it's yeah, you, you always sort of it's a delicate balance, isn't it? The but, acidity yeah. from that may be coming from the sugar. So if um, you're having a fruit juice, which is something that we don't recommend mm. anymore as part of. Um, if you're literally having like apple juice, you've got mm. rid of all the fiber, you have a high amount of the natural sugar fructose. Yes. Um, and so you're basically having the equivalent of like a sugar yeah. sweetened beverage, like Coca-Cola or whatever, um, which can increase your uric acid level as well. Um, mm. So that might be one of the reasons why. I think that would be contributing. Yeah. Uh, other drinks, sorry. I, uh, yeah, so yes. we're going off yeah, on a yeah, tangent yeah. with lemon juice there, yeah. which I liked. <laughs> um, so um, in, in general, tea, is yeah. considered to be bad, a little bit controversial in studies because some big studies that have grouped everything together have sort of not shown a difference. Mm. So there may be a volume effect that's that's playing out there as well, but tea does have oxalate in it. So again, just be mm. aware of that. Okay. If you have 15 cups of tea a day, and people do. A lot of people yeah. do, yeah. People yeah. do, yeah. then that is probably, that is too much. Yeah. I think um, you could say that's black tea, isn't it, rather than green yeah. tea, just yeah, I was gonna say, yeah, like the other English types. breakfast, uh, yes. the, black, the black tea that are, have the oxalates in it so okay. other things may be okay or may yeah and there's a difference between brewing time as well if you're someone who dips the tea bag in and takes it out yeah then that is going to be far lower risk than someone who lets it stew in there until yeah. the mm. teaspoon almost stands up in it so yeah yeah there's yeah. a, there a yeah. massive difference, <laughs> yeah. difference in that as well yeah um and then That's regarding party. yeah and then regarding <laughs> fizzy drinks generally carbonated these carbonated drinks bad for kidney stones yeah. but certain ones are worse than others so things like diet coke diet mm. pepsi that sort of thing are there and it's because they're acidified using phosphoric acid phosphoric acid yeah so if you're going to have uh, anything you're better off with things like diet and they're all better being diet because of the sugar like you mentioned yeah mm. so diet seven up diet sprite diet sunkist those have been shown to be better because they've got their acidified with citric acid ah mm. okay so it depends on the t yeah, i guess it, it's on the ingredients list yeah yes It'll yeah, be there. Is, yeah you can just look that's on what i was thinking when you were saying earlier about sugar i was thinking that the the acid component is uh, yeah is different and important yeah but but some people drink a litre mm. of coke a day. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's not uncommon. No. And that is definitely that. increasing your risk. Yeah. yeah. Cause you're, actually, you're, you're, probably this is to this podcast, don't really realise that, actually. We, we all live in our little bubble, mm. right? You know, where we feel like everyone understands, like, coke is bad for you or mm. sugar sweetened beverages are bad for you. But it's a, it's a very common occurrence. I've, I've seen that in primary care, secondary care. It's just, yeah, it's terrible. Um, other drinks. So you, you mentioned green tea there. Uh, mm. Is that has that got oxalates in? Probably have to do some research on that. So uh, if it does, it's much lower than black tea because that's the one that's always mentioned on the the yeah. list as a problem. Yeah. In particular, um, so I, I, you know, I assume that would be fine for you. But I guess the only caveat as a urologist would be to say that there is caffeine there, which may have a knock-on effect in terms of your um, bladder overactivity and frequency. Ah, uh, okay. Uh -huh. um, so it's a slightly different issue that you may have with that. But yeah, I think. If that sort of flavoring helps, mm -hmm. like, like a sort of light squash, you know, the, the concentration might be key there as well. In yeah. Terms of like make, not making it too concentrated. Yeah. Quick dip in and out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's coffee. been looked at in studies. Studies have looked yeah. at at brewing time and stuff oh, really? like that. Yeah. Oh, so. And caffeine is bad. Caffeine also dehydrates you, doesn't it? Yeah. Mm. It's yeah. got a mild diuretic effect. Yeah. So it makes you pee more. Yeah. yeah. So although that's transiently good, actually, in the long term, that dehydrates you. Yeah. And it's bad for kidney stones, isn't it? So yeah. I worked for someone once who said always, if you have a coffee, always just uh, your kidney stone former, have a glass of water with it with as it. well. Mm. Yeah. And he said that's what they do on the continent because they understand this. I'm not sure that's why. They do, but, <laughs> you know, uh, but you yeah. always get given a glass of water. You get yeah. Given a yeah. Very yeah. strong coffee and a glass of water. If you go to a mm. good coffee house, even in London these days, they'll always give you uh, some water, water with your with your coffee. Mm -hmm. um, so top tip for uh, <laughs> if you go to a good coffee house, they'll give you a bit of co uh, a bit good bit of water with that as well. 
Um, I don't uh, think I had anything else with fluids, did you? I think that's the, my main mm. stuff. Um, yeah. Alcohol, I suppose. Yeah. yeah. Some of you Actually, listeners I'm, might drink yeah, alcohol. Same, no, I, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I enjoy a nice glass of wine every now and then. <laughs> People always ask about beer because they're like that. If I drink lots of beer, then I'm peeing loads. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess you just can't really recommend it. No. Beer. <laughs> no. <laughs> Although Any I came kind of across, uh, I don't know uh, how up to date this was. I think it was from like 2019. They found that uh, moderate drinkers actually had a slightly re reduced risk of stones, mm. which I, I personally didn't understand, but. Yeah, so it, it seems that as long as you're not drinking excessively, it shouldn't mm. be an issue and you're hydrating properly, but... Yeah, I mean, yeah. I sort of fall back on the normal advice about alcohol and yeah. not yeah. excessively anyway, so yeah. actually you shouldn't be doing that from a lifestyle point of view, should I? So yeah. You know, yeah. standard 14 or 21 units, whatever yeah. it is, yeah. per week type of advice. But I guess you're, that's all fluid, it is fluid, isn't it? But that's yeah. not the recommend, it's not recommended you should have two pints of beer a day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But people often with colic, so when they get colic pain, say, oh, I'm going to drink more beer because then flush it out. <laughs> <laughs> and there probably is something in that, isn't there? Because actually yeah. you do want to make sure you're maintaining good hydration. You don't yeah. need to go crazy, mm. but maintaining good hydration. But so some people do swear by that. Yeah. yeah. Um, citrate, sub uh, well, on the subject of lemon juice, I just wrote mm. citrate supplement. You can get citrate supplements these days. Is that something that we use at all? Is that any Would that be, do you know what that's... Con combined with I'm not too no. sure yeah mm. no, no. i just i just wrote it down as we were talking about lemon juice <clears throat> and the impact of citrate on uh, oxalate stones specifically yeah is that something you looked at with your supplement well i mean so we alkalize the urine with mm. potassium citrate yeah. Yeah. That's what we use. Yeah, yeah yeah that's what we use and it can mm. come in different forms mm. so yeah. um and so yeah and that can be liquid effervescent mm. tablets uh -huh. or or tablets but they're very hard to get hold of yeah but that's the mm. medical forms yeah i think on Amazon, you can find all sorts of things. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. But it's very hard to advise on those because we don't really know what's in them. Mm. Uh, there are some well-known brands in America. There's a couple of papers that have got like a list of 10 of the top brands. And they do actually list the alkali quantity, the oh, okay. quantity in them because that's the important mm. thing. What, what I wouldn't, I don't know by just looking at a thing on Amazon and going, oh yeah, that is whether that's good or bad. What is actually in it, what you're marketing it for. So, mm. But potentially mm. something that's that like that yeah. will be good at alkalizing the urine and mm -hmm. generally that's a good thing to do okay mm. um without, let's without recommending it without yeah. Recommend, yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> without recommending it yeah yeah, yeah. And yeah, yeah. And you, i think with all this stuff you really do need to like work with your primary care physician as mm. well uh, or your urologist if you if if you have one um vitamin d is very common uh, mm. i recommend vitamin d is something that people should at least get checked mm. a lot of uh, it's part of government guidance during uh, winter months particularly for people with darker skin complexion. Uh, adverse effects of vitamin D, um, are there? So any? vitamin D is the sort of, the, you don't want it too high or too low. You want the sort of Goldilocks, Goldilocks in the middle, yeah. on, yeah, in the yeah, middle yeah. yeah, essentially. So if it is too low, the, um, yeah, exactly. You can cause uh, issues with that as well. Because mm -hmm. um, it's linked with your calcium again. So it's essentially increasing your calcium uh, reabsorption. So you want it in the right levels where it's, it's not too excessive, essentially. Mm, yeah. Um, but yeah. But how do you know that unless you're going to get mm. tested? So therefore, you should have it tested. Yeah. 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 So, so particularly people who have come to see us with kidney stones and they're on vitamin D. Yeah. You know, do you actually need it? Why are you taking it? If it was given by their GP because of medical advice, then then again, risk benefit. That's probably fine, isn't it? Yeah. You probably mm -hmm. do need it. Or if it was given to, for medical reason because you had low vitamin D, yeah. then that's yeah. good and that's fine. If you're just given it because it was a healthy thing to do, so I'm having my vitamin C, vitamin D, and all mm. of this, yeah. then you've got to work out whether they're actually going to be too high as yeah. well. So, yeah. But generally, I think our feeling has been that vitamin D on its own as a supplement doesn't particularly increase your risk of kidney stones, probably because you're just going, you're correcting the population from yeah. tending to be on the low side, particularly mm. in winter months, to tending to be in the normal range. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that, and that's a good, and that's where you want to be. Yeah. Mm. The risk is that some, sup some supplements have got calcium in them as well, so they yes. combine calcium and vitamin D together. Yes. Mm. And so calcium supplements are definitely bad for kidney stones. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Um, there's no two ways about that. Yeah. Just for the reasons we said earlier, you know, mm. you want normal calcium, but calcium supplements are going to are going to put, are gonna put you up quite a long way, I think, because yeah. you get you should get your thousand milligrams or whatever it is mm. relatively easy in your diet, yeah. unless you're, you know, unless you have a very strange diet or something. So yeah. well, that's so quite get that. easy with with dairy, isn't it? Yeah, um, yeah. I suppose, but, um, yes, if you not yeah. if you don't have dairy, then then yes. Yeah. Um, so if you take calcium supplements, I think what I said about it is there's got to be a good reason why you take it. Yeah. And there are mm -hmm. good reasons. You know, people get osteoporosis. Um, risk of fractures from that, and that's mm -hmm. you know a ten to fifteen year risk, isn't it? Mm. Which is which is improved with calcium supplements, but uh, it's that risk benefit ratio. And I'm as a urologist, okay. I'm not here to try and judge what your individual risk is for osteoporosis and yeah. getting um, 
uh, and getting well, potentially uh, fractures from yeah. it. But I can advise you on the fact that this increases your risk of getting kidney stones yep. by being on the supplement. So then you've got to work out with whoever prescribed it yep. where that benefit is. If it was given just mm. because, oh, yeah, it's a good idea, you're, you know, you're 65 mm. now, we'll give you some calcium supplements, I would say that's not a good reason to be yeah. on them. And maybe you should be referred for some, you know, like a bone DEXA scan or yes. something like that yeah, yeah. to prove whether you have osteoporosis and whether, yeah. you, whether you need it or not yep. is what I say to patients. Yeah. In the situation mm. where you are told you should or you, you you do need to take it yeah there's a definite benefit to taking your calcium supplements at, with meals mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. that's because we, like we've already talked about the calcium when it goes in, in with your meal binds the oxalate from that meal mm -hmm. in the gut right, so yes. some of that then comes out as the, as calcium oxalate in your feces mm -hmm. and doesn't get absorbed yeah so if you don't do it at that time then you're getting your more, more calcium being absorbed yeah. you take it outside meal times mm -hmm. and you're not binding it with the oxalate which is also then being absorbed at meal times yeah so you're definitely increasing your risk of getting mm. kidney stone formation by doing that yeah if you think about that 24-hour mm. time period and you've got these spikes of different things so i'm having a big uh, rich meal of spinach my oxalate level goes up there <laughs> and then i i take my calcium later on that day and i have a big mm. spike of calcium you're not giving the opportunity for the calcium and oxalate to bind and be naturally processed through feces. So I, I guess that's mm -hmm. like that's that's generally good advice if you have yeah. a genuine indication for taking calcium supplements. I won't ask you to go into calcium homeostasis here, <laughs> but low vitamin yeah. D. Why would low vitamin? If I had a, a naturally low vitamin D, why would that be uh, a risk factor for uh, renal stones? Because, do you want me to answer that? Yeah, go for it. Because <laughs> yeah. parathyroid hormone mm -hmm. mm. controls, is involved in controlling um, vitamin D and calcium. Mm -hmm. And so when you've got a low vitamin D, yep. your parathyroid hormone goes up to try and compensate for that. And by doing that, it generates mm -hmm. generates more calcium mm -hmm. protection in the body. So it increases your, the amount of calcium. Yeah. So therefore, you get, a, you get a higher calcium and therefore increased risk of kidney stones. So if you correct the vitamin D, if it's low, you increase it, you bring down your parathyroid hormone. Yep. And then you, so then you, you correct the calcium. Yep. And we see that mm. sometimes in blood tests. You do it and the calcium is a little bit high. Um, and that's because of the, you then need to check to see the vitamin D because maybe it's the vitamin D that's the problem and they do need vitamin D. Yeah, great. <laughs> I, I said thanks. I wasn't. Yeah, right. thanks. Sorry, yeah, no, thanks. Yeah, I got that right. I yeah, think yeah, no, that's, that's right. Yeah, it's that's basically, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, it's uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I, I did. I, I did find some stuff on mm. on particular uh, types of microbes that degrade oxalate, but there isn't too much evidence around that. And the last paper I saw was literally like eight mm. years ago. But I think it's sort of a, one of these spaces which is like watch this space. Mm. I, I think there's going to be a lot more. Um, uh, research looking at particular types of microbes that will degrade uh, oxalates in your in your gut. Um, so that's definitely. I mean, a high fiber diet is recommended. Uh, mm. as that, you know, it could be uh, for a whole bunch of things, but um, it might be related to the fact that it's improving your microbiota, um, which can improve uh, the oxalate balance. But uh, in terms of other supplements that we are aware of that have a potential beneficial effect, what what other ones are that we've talked about? Um, mm. Uh, vitamin D and, and so I mean the other thing people take mm. about, I don't know about benefit but risk um, is protein supplements uh -huh. well yeah so protein build up drinks I go to the gym I need to do this mm -hmm. um, and I universally say that that increases your risk of kidney stones mm -hmm. so people with kidney stones should avoid them yeah yeah, I think it's is quite it common actually to see like maybe someone who's going for weight gain, like uh, muscle size, I think so. Yeah. Just going to the gym a lot and being uh, quite built up to have uh, kidney stones now. So, and that's, you know, you could say that's quite likely to be related to the supplements. Yeah. Mm. Um, and there's clear evidence that that's, yeah. that is bad. So, yeah. definitely. Um, uh, some people don't like it because obviously they do it and they want to build up, they want to build up their muscles and they say yeah. they need it because they're doing it all. Yeah. And I tell them they need to go and see a dietitian or a nutritionist in that uh -huh. situation because I can't advise you then. Yeah. But in general, protein build-up drinks and shakes are bad for kidney stones. Okay, mm -hmm. fine. Because th th they're being marketed pretty heavily, I think, mm. these days, particularly to men who are at more risk of, mm. of kidney stones in general. Um, and is it because of the uh, excess amount of purines that would lead to acidification in in the in the kidneys. Is that the yeah? I think it's the, the sort of amino acids, particularly in um, the animal protein, that, that it will end up then acidifying your urine. Okay. If yeah. it was a vegan protein, I know. Yeah. So I don't think it has the same effect, but it doesn't mean that I could then particularly recommend vegan protein. I, I don't know if there's any other risks with it, but I don't, it wouldn't have that effect. I know for sure. Yeah, because yeah. they're d generally derived from like peas, brown mm. rice, um, hemp. 
Yeah, um, but that's not what people are taking, as I don't think, are they, for gym supplements? Oh yeah, it's becoming I a know, trend. You know. I think as more people move to mm. more flexi and plant-based diets, these types of yeah. powders are becoming a lot more popular. But because the I typical guess ones have, are whey protein, yeah. aren't they? Which the is kind one, of one, yeah, traditionally the incumbents are whey from yeah. dairy. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And people try to argue that with me and say it's it's whey. That's fine, and it's definitely not. Because I then I looked it <laughs> yeah. up. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. I saw that patient. I went away and I thought I'm just going to check that. Yeah, that definitely does increase your risk as well. Yeah. Okay. Um, intuitively, I think your, your your other your sort of vegetarian vegan supplements are probably fine. Yeah, yeah. intuitively, yeah. that's what I think as well. But it's it's one of those where you don't know if you can really recommend it because it, yeah, I don't know but if there's any evidence for that. Yeah, um, I think it's also you know looking at your total protein consumption and and actually seeing whether a supplement of protein is even necessary. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, I think most people are obsessed good with point. protein and, and actually they should be more concerned with the quality of their diet, the amount of fiber in their diet and making sure they don't have all the other additives like mm. sugar and, and yeah. excess sodium. That's right. And I think if you're getting kidney stones and then you're thinking about that, that's when you need to get advice on that. Yeah. And yeah. I, said, mm. I don't think as urologists we can do that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But it is an important thing to ask, like you said about mm. the vitamin C. You don't ask about vitamin C. You don't necessarily ask about exactly, about yeah. protein unless mm. they, uh, for me, unless someone looks like they go to the gym. You go, do you go to the gym? Or <laughs> yeah. Do you take protein? Oh yeah, yeah. I take, yeah. I take, oh, that's naughty. You know. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. Exactly. So, yeah. I've seen the outcome. Yeah. You know? <laughs> but people are surprised. Yeah. They don't realize that. The yeah. Risk for kidney stones. Mm. Yeah. There are a bunch of other supplements that you can find, particularly mm. expensive ones uh, that are, you know shown or you know, claimed to, to be beneficial mm. for, for different I mean I looked at uh, just this briefly online to yeah. for, for the purposes of this talk really uh, or this um, discussion and uh, from what I could see in, in the terms of what they contained a lot of them just didn't seem to have any you know anything that I would recognize as helpful for, for reducing stones but um, that, that's I think that's the th problem with supplements there's not really a regulated area is yeah. it um, yeah. And I, yeah, it's, it's not a regulated area. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I, I did I did research this a little bit. You, you looked into this in quite a bit uh, of depth. Yeah. Yeah. Talk last year, yeah. yeah. So there is very little evidence for any of it. Mm. Okay. And of course, people are going to say, well, just because you haven't studied it, and you you know you medics don't like you know mm. only rely on evidence. You don't want to look at it because it, it goes against your traditional yeah. medicines. Sure, but if it was that good, then people would have done because drug companies and everyone would pick it up and go, yeah. we're going to mark, we're going to make money out of this. Yeah. 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 So I well so. So there's very little, so first of all, I think people need to be aware there's very little evidence. Uh -huh. You also don't know what harm you're doing. Mm -hmm. You don't know what's in these things. Um, and probably less so with kidney stone um, supplements that you find, but certainly there's a lot of supplements for um, erectile dysfunction, mm. for uh, muscle muscle building and things. Mm. And a lot of those are adulterated with other drugs. Mm. And there was just something like a, a, a quite a high figure of amount of supplements, particularly in those areas, where it's adulterated with common drugs that we use. Mm. So all sorts of things, steroids, oh, wow. right, right, whole, yeah. and that's how they work. And yeah. some of them have got Viagra in them. So they don't, mm. they don't say it on the label, yeah. but that's of course how they work. So yeah. people take them and think, oh yeah, this great herbal medicine yeah. that I pay 30 pounds a month for, it's really helping my erections, but actually it's because it's got one of the drugs that you yeah. prescribe for right, it, isn't it? Yeah. Right, so yeah, that's yeah. why. So It's just the standard drug. Yeah. yeah. So I think that's less so with kidney stones, mm. but there's definitely at risk of mm. what, what is actually in that. Mm. Second thing I say is just be careful because somebody is making money out of this. Mm. You know, this isn't for free. Yeah. <laughs> so someone somewhere is making money out of being able to mm. market this to you yeah. with pretty outrageous claims on some of them about what they do. And, mm. it's, and it's not based on good evidence because there's very little evidence. There's like, you know, Hundred, you know, hundreds of these things. Yeah, yeah. Um, loads of different products, loads of different things mixed up. Some of which actually do the opposite. So some, quite a lot have got cranberry in them. Cranberries thought to be a good thing for the urinary tract. Mm. People take it for urinary tract infections. Mm. Slightly acidifies your urine, if anything. Yeah. But actually, that's like we talked about. That's probably bad for kidney stones. Yeah. yeah. So, mm. uh, but it's marketed as being, you know, mm. but then it's can, they can market it as being, you know, specific for the urinary tract because it's got cranberry in it. But it mm. might be, but it's not good for kidney stones. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. and I, I always sort of like look at one paper that I saw, which was looking at. They just took a whole bunch of, I think it was cranberry or, or some particular compound, which said it had a certain amount, like one gram of this in each uh, in each packet. Mm. And the amount that actually was contained varied between each packet. And then even within the packet itself, between the different tablets, there was a big variation in the actual yeah. amount. So it's like, well, you know, if you're taking this, you've got no idea really what you're you're actually achieving because like you said, it's not regulated. So yeah. no regulation is there. So, yeah. Yeah. so there's lots of things and people do come in taking these things. So, you know, yeah. I've yeah. Had, had some pain, been to A&E, been diagnosed with a kidney stone online and then come in with various different things. One of them is called Chanca Piedra, which is mm. what's known as stone breaker. That's one of the common things. The, yeah. 
tiny little bit of evidence when I looked that up, but not very much. And uh -huh. some of it's negative, quite a lot of side effects in some of the studies with that. All right. So that's that's a herb that's found What's it in called? Chanca. a chanca piedra or stonebreaker. Stonebreaker. Oh, right. Quebra quebra piedra as well. It's got mm. various different names. Oh, is, that um, is, that, is that derived from a plant or mm, a root or yeah, something? Isn't yeah. It? Yeah. Okay, I've seen that. From a yeah. leaf, I think. Yeah. And um, they sell that for a lot. I mean, that's expensive. Yeah. The tablet. Yeah. <laughs> it's like um, ridiculous. And the, the trouble is with small eurotoic stones, small eurotoic stones tend to pass. Mm. So if you do nothing, they pass. They pass. You drink water, they pass. Yeah. You stand mm. on your head, they pass. Yeah. You take this this herbal medicine, they pass. And then you go, yeah. oh, look, I swear this worked because I passed yeah. my stone. Yeah. So it isn't really yeah. proof unless someone does a mm. proper study. And, that, yeah. and that's the problem with it. Yeah. Uh, the other common one is apple cider vinegar. Yeah. yeah. No human, no studies in humans at nothing all. Nothing at all. Nothing mm. at all in okay. humans to show that that works. Mm -hmm. There's some, I found one animal study that showed a very tiny alteration mm. in the acidity of the urine and tried to justify that as therefore it prevents stones. Mm. As in, did it alkalize, uh, alkalize Well, I think it's tiny, it was, I presume so, but it was a tiny amount. Tiny, okay. So mm. actually, but if it was that good, someone's gonna, someone's gonna do it. So, you know, um, I, yeah, I think you just gotta be careful. And yeah. there, are, there are horror stories, aren't there, from you know, over the years of herbal medicines that go wrong as well, yeah. and are then years down the line found to have Mm. Uh, to have you know cancer forming properties and stuff like that so mm. just be very careful with what you're taking because there will be, almost yeah. certainly be no evidence for that sort of thing yeah the type of things you then find online to we, about alkalization may well do for the reasons we said that may well be reasonable but it's yeah. just mm. the problem is finding finding the one that is actually good and is yeah. has got the right amount of alkali in it to to do yeah. to have the desired thing and therefore you should probably be measuring your ph to and that sort of joins this whole conversation yeah. up, doesn't it? That yeah, yeah. you're going to do it, you should measure your pH to see. <laughs> Rather than just take a tablet and go, oh, well, I'm on yeah. this thing from Amazon. That it, it must be preventing my stones. Yeah. And I, I think also yeah. it, with regards to checking your pH, if you don't know what type of stone you have, that can also not be beneficial as well. So well, exactly. You, you yeah. need to make sure you have all the, the information correctly mm. before you start doing all these things. And alkalizing, um, like, which it could be done with other uh, medications or other supplements that maybe have sodium in them because sodium bicarbonate is quite a common one then that may have a knock-on effect of increasing your calcium in your urine so mm -hmm. it's not necessarily just alkalization itself as well so it's, it's just about yeah 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 being getting the right thing I guess yeah, yeah. Um, any other supplements that are positive or, or have we covered all of those <laughs> <laughs> yeah. after that I think list, he's gonna, <laughs> not gonna be like actually this is yeah. the one that works but, the, but there aren't there's nothing we we yeah. recommend to patients is no, so there's no nothing, i don't think yeah. there is anything that is yeah not for this well yeah. i think there's like water there's water is a supplement <laughs> yeah and it's free from a tap yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> i think we've covered a lot of things that people can do to mm. make sure they d they, they're yeah. not at risk of a, a stone if they have anything in their family history or if they have a recurrent stone as well and i think if mm. a lot of people did that i mean i I, I read something uh, about just fluid, uh, hi hydrating yourself appropriately mm. can reduce the recurrence up to like 30%. Is that right? For certain types of stones, yeah. I guess. Yeah, I think that's the, the evidence that's kind of in the, in, say in the bowel leaflets even, I think yeah. something like 30 to yeah, 40%. Yeah. Yeah. Which figure, yeah. The figure I quote is two mm. litres, more than, if you reliably make two litres of urine coming out every day, yeah. Yeah. that yeah. might be difficult, every day, yeah. mm -hmm. you reduce your risk by 20%. That's the figure I quote from one of the papers. So right. but that's in the same ballpark, isn't so it? So yeah, 20 yeah. to 30%, maybe yeah. you could say. Yeah. 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 Brilliant, that's awesome. Well, I think we've uh, we've covered <laughs> a lot <laughs> <laughs> on kidney stones, bar the surgical intervention. Well, I'll yeah. let you guys yeah. chat about that. Uh, we surgeons, awesome. we love operating. Yeah, well, yeah, exactly. Yeah. But don't do any of what we said. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. If you enjoyed that video, you'll love the library of content that we have on doctorskitchen.com. Make sure you hit subscribe. And we have podcasts in our library on brain health, well-being, supplements, and lots more. Have a wonderful day.